Welcome to the Tornado Walk. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I am the Museum Services Manager here for the Sandusky Library and Fallout House Museum. Uh, some of you may know me already. I recognize a few names, a few faces. Um, so I'm glad you all came to join us. So we will be talking about the 1924 tornado that hit Sandusky. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my PowerPoint with everyone. Share. Thinking, thinking real hard. Hit the wrong button. Present. All right. Can everyone see that? Yep. All right. Very good. So, welcome to the 1924 tornado. For sure. Um, so, I should have put in another title screen, but as some of you may know, uh, this the tornado that hit Sandusky, uh, the big tornado was. June 28th, 1924. Uh, so what we're going to do in this program is we're going to look a little bit at, well, we're mostly going to look at the damage the tornado uh, wrought. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the businesses and the, uh, one chip and do a little bit of back history, but mostly um, I think it's interesting. We all know Sandusky pretty well and uh, know the area. And I this, we'll kind of do a, we're going to kind of follow the path of the tornado to see the damage it caused. Um, so we'll start with uh, what was probably the first victim of the tornado, which was the Columbus. Uh, so the Columbus was an auto ferry. Uh, it was run by the uh, Bailey Transport Company. It ran to Dansbury, Ohio. Uh, originally started in either 1918 or 19 uh, by George W. Mele, that's the Mele Transport Company. Uh, its usual place of docking was at the Jackson Street Pier. Um, now, most of you probably recognize where this is. Um, you can clearly see this is the what was the Hind Dauk building in the background. Um, of course, now it's apartment complexes. And you can see here is the auto ferry in the water. Uh, so at the time when the tornado hit, the Columbus was just about, was just getting ready to actually leave the Jackson Pier dock. It had a full load of cars and it had about uh, 70 people on the ship. Uh, as it was leaving dock, it got hit by the tornado. It got blown over and to where the Jet Express docks today, it hit a uh, another ship that was used uh, a dredging scow. And I think I have a of that. No, I don't. Nope, I don't. Um, so I'll come back. Uh, and there it sank. Uh, luckily, all the people on board uh, either were able to swim over to the slip for safety or several of them made it onto the dredging scow uh, to be rescued and saved from there eventually. Um, so we have a picture of the ship and you just saw it. Um, they did, they were able actually to salvage a lot of the cars from the lake. Um, so you can see here, uh, this would be of course not the Jackson Street Pier, but closer over to where the steps are right to the water by the uh, Jet Express uh, slip. And what's interesting, and you'll see them throughout, uh, these men in uniform, these are national uh, Ohio National Guard members. So after the tornado hit uh, us and it did horrible damage to the rain, which we'll talk a little bit about a little bit later, uh, the National Guard was deployed. They were in town. They helped for a while. Um, so they'll crop up in a couple of pictures. But you can see these are Ohio National Guardsmen helping to pull cars out of the lake. Here's another one, same thing, where you can see they're working on pulling uh, pulling cars out of the lake from the end of the slip. Uh, you can see that's the GA Beckling in the background, the ship most of us are familiar with. Um, what I think is also interesting is if you look way in the background towards the top, kind of where my mouth is, you can see there's one person on the roof 
of this building back here, which is the Lay Brothers Fishery Building, which we'll talk about. Uh, but I, that's why I include this picture because of the person on the roof. I thought it was very interesting. Um, and then here's the, basically the same picture again, but you can see they are hauling these cars out of the lake by their wheels. And, you know, that was kind of the spectator thing to watch at the time. Uh, now we'll talk about the Cedar Point building. Uh, so the building that Cedar Point was using at the time uh, we all are probably a lot of people are familiar with uh, the building right by where Jet Express uses today, and we kind of think of that as the Cedar Point building, but that's actually the third or fourth Cedar Point building that was built for the transport company for people to get on the ferries. Um, the one that you see in this picture was, uh, was originally built in 1911. It replaced an older building that was built in 1901. Um, and of course, it was right in the path of this tornado. And so this is a before picture. Um, and here's an after picture where you can see all that structure is basically gone. Have another one of it. And then here's one more picture of it uh, from towards the end of the slip. And you can see once again, all of that structure is basically gone and blown away and no one knows where it is. Uh, one of the strokes of luck during this and one of the things that probably kept the death death toll very, very low for Sandusky uh, was the GA Beckling uh, at the time saw the bad weather and they stayed docked at Cedar Point. So they weren't in the bay or anywhere near, you know, near where the path of the tornado when this happened. So luckily that helped to keep the number of people who died down. Um, also the tornado struck on a Saturday and as we'll see, it does hit some residential areas, but the major damage it does is to uh, some of the, like the industrial waterfront area of Sandusky. So because of this, that once again, keeps that death a little bit lower. Uh, so this building, like I said, the Cedar Point Transport Company building was destroyed, and then it was replaced with the building we see today um, on the other side where Jet Express is. Uh, so one of the big fisheries in town was the Lay Brothers uh, Fish Company. Uh, they were originally started in 1870 uh, by two brothers, John and Jacob Lay, hence Lay Brothers Fish Company. Um, they were also uh, did ice harvesting on the bay. They were actually the last people in Sandusky to do ice harvesting in 1901. I think was the last time they harvest ice uh, in the bay. Um, but, uh, so that's a before picture, and then we have a couple, you can see, we saw from the other side when we were looking at the uh, water, you can see the building for the most part did survive. Uh, but as you can see, the roof is pretty much totally gone on this side. Um, and you can see at the end, there was some more debris. Let's have another one. And here's just another angle of the same thing where, uh, there would be railroad tracks where they're standing on, but you can see the damage along the side here where the roof is gone. You can see the damage here in the front. And it's just kind of amazing that they did this, but like I said, they were harvesting ice for a while. Um, so they did rebuild. Uh, so they did rebuild, but unfortunately in 1932, they had a fire and that destroyed a good chunk of their building. They rebuilt again, and they actually stayed until 1961. Um, so they were a long running company and were able to recover from the tornado and they were able to recover from the <clears throat> from the fire afterwards and was able to stay in business in Sandusky. Um, the Yacht Club. So the Yacht Club, it was like right at the end of the pier by Lay Brothers Fisheries. Um, and here's a nice, very nice before picture we have. You can see there's actually a lifeguard on duty right here. Uh, there's a nice audience watching something. And there were back, you can see the tip of a boat here. Behind that, there were some docks where they where people would dock boats. This was the original yacht club. Um, and here's what's left of it. 
And the answer is not much. Uh, you can see here is that lifeguard stand that survived, but the entirety of the structure is gone. There's nothing there. Um, there were some people at the yacht club when this happened. Uh, from the accounts, they were they were thrown into the water, but no one was killed. Um, I don't know if any of them ended up in the hospital. There were uh, quite a few people ended up in a good Samaritan hospital at the time, but I don't. I, it doesn't really give me a clear account of where they all were. Um, but you can see, and I think I have another picture, and here's another angle. Um, so here's the Lay Brothers Fishery. Here, um, and here's the yacht club and just totally gone. The the dock survived, uh, but the structure's gone. Uh, it actually took them a long time to rebuild. Uh, it wasn't until 1939, so 15 years later, that they finally built a new permanent yacht club, um, and that is in the location where the yacht club is today. Um, the... Let's see. Um, before that, they just they moved around to different sites. They used different private docks and houses to hold meetings and things like that. Uh, but it really wasn't until 1939 that they actually could build their new building. And here's a picture of one. No one really took a good picture of another coal. There's a coal company here in the background, the Hunt and Vice uh, Coal, and you can see their roof is pretty well damaged as well here in the background. Uh, so this is the uh, Grouch Coal Company. It was originally founded in 1873 as Grouch and Mackey because uh, it was Fred, founded by Fred Grouch and E.B. Mackey. Mackey. Um, eventually, it just becomes Grouch. I believe Fred buys out his business partner, if I remember correctly, uh, in 1886. Uh, unfortunately, they actually have three people who die here. Um, I know it says nine buried and one killed on the postcard, uh, but that's unfortunately inaccurate. There were three people who died uh, here. Uh, one was uh, Minette Ruth Margaret. Uh, she worked at Grass Cole since her graduation from Sandusky High School in 1922. So she would have been you know, somewhere around 20 years old. Um, she worked as a secretary for the company. Um, and she was in this building. Um, so Grouch Coal kind of was split by the railroad. They had a building out uh, facing what, uh, out on Water Street. Um, and then on the other side of the railroad tracks, uh, what Shoreline Drive today would have been their big coal yard and their main buildings. Um, so she was in this building. Um, also, died in this building was a uh, uh, man or boy, unfortunately, uh, Howard Van Barcombe. Uh, he was 10 years old. Uh, his parents had an apartment on the second story of this building. Um, so it would have been, you know, about this height. And he was up there with his two sisters at the, the day of the tornado. The building, of course, you can see is totally destroyed. Um, both his sisters survived. Uh, one of them did end up in the hospital. And of course, he unfortunately perished. And uh, like I said, there were about nine people buried alive throughout the whole Grouch Coal complex. There were a lot of them. Uh, the other person who died at Grouch Coal, uh, his name was William Hampton. He was a driver for Grouch Coal. Um, and once again, he was in this front building when it was destroyed. Um, so there were only six deaths in Sandusky, um, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, like I said, when we get to Lorraine, they had a much higher death toll. Uh, we only had six, but three of those three of those deaths were in this one building. Um, and as you can see, they got hit very hard. Um, now, what's interesting about Grash Coal is they put advertisements out three days after the tornado saying that they were open for business again. So even though their facility was totally decimated, uh, they stayed open and they kept uh, running and uh, kept their business going. 
And this is a little bit different angle. This is the Roush Coal Building here. Um, but the, you can see there's this arch gateway. Uh, this is uh, Fasher Park. So this was a, uh, the park was originally built in 1892. Um, it was pursued or built or pushed through city council by Voltaire uh, Scott and Samuel Fasher. Uh, Samuel Fasher was a big proponent of parks in town. Uh, he kept up with them. And he's the reason that it's named Fasher Park because it's named after him. Um, I just thought it was an interesting angle. And of course, we know where the park is today. So that kind of helps to orient you where this picture is. And you can actually, uh, part of my tornado walk is we're going to stand here and, you know, look at this picture, standing at the exact place where this photographer stood 97 years ago. So it's quite, it, it's interesting. Uh, side note, they had water fountains in the park by this point in time, which I thought was pretty interesting. And this is another, there's a back picture of Fraser Park where so you can see the, the trees blown over. Uh, but other than that, this street survived. And, and you can see the other side of the street, there's some broken windows. If you look very closely, um, but it didn't get hit hard. The b and Railroad. Um, so some of you may know the big b and Rail Yard is or was where Shoreline Park is today. Um, and the roundhouse was kind of right where that first parking lot is by, uh, if you're thinking of Shoreline Park. Um, and that's what this is a picture of. This is a picture of the, um, of the roundhouse where they would store locomotives. Here you can see this is a locomotive all covered in scrap. Um, also where they would, they could turn trains around, hence a roundhouse, they had a big mechanism. The roundhouse was built uh, somewhere in 1891 or 92, uh, and the B&O Rail Railroad had been in Sandusky since 1871. Um, and they had, besides this, they had different offices and other buildings on the premises. Um, here's another angle. You can see all the tracks because it's the big rail yard, the car blown over, uh, another angle of the roundhouse destroyed. Um, some power lines still standing, though, surprisingly enough. And uh, once more of the rail yard with the with the cars blown over, you can see scrap metal piled, buildings destroyed in the background. Um, now, the b &O rail yard, this is where one of the people in uh, did die. Uh, his name was Robert E. McKee. Uh, he was an agent for the company. Uh, he'd actually worked for BNO for 42 years. So, you know, he'd, he'd been working there for a long time. Um, he unfortunately was in one of the offices and the tornado picked the safe up and dropped it on him. Um, so he unfortunately died of you know, not what we would think as a traditional tornado injur injury, um, but yeah, he had a safe dropped on him in the office where he worked uh, in here. Um, it doesn't say where exactly he was in the rail yard, what office he was in, uh, but we do know he was somewhere there. I think I have another picture. Yeah, this is another good long picture of the rail yard and all of the you can see the people in the background uh, because, you know, this is a big event and everyone wants to go see what the damage was that was done to the rail yard. Um, and you can just see all the, you know, just the how much, you know, how much this tornado, how powerful it was as pushing rail cars over, pulling the wheels off of them at times, um, things like that. It's also interesting. You can see, you can tell this is B and O because it has the the B and O right on the rail card there. Um, yeah, so it gives you a really good kind of view of that. So B and O after the tornado, of course, they stayed in town. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly when the roundhouse was removed, uh, but it stopped showing up as an address around 1939, 1940. Um, I know it's totally gone by 1950, just based on Sanborn maps. Um, now, this is some of you might remember the city actually buys the land of the B and O rail yard in 1978 to build Shoreline Park. Uh, that was a uh, part of the kind of the planned renovation when they were working on Battery Park as well. They bought the land to build Shoreline Park. Um, I know the city starts work early in 1979 to start making it into a park. Um, but here's kind of the confusion, something I've never been able to figure out. Um, the B&O Rail uh, Company maintained a freight office on Water Street right by the park until 1982. Uh, so I don't know if they had an agreement with the city, excuse me, to keep that running or if, you know, if, if maybe there's a problem with the directories, I'm not sure. Uh, so I haven't been able to get a firm answer on that yet, uh, but we do know they maintained a presence till 1982, and then by then, B&O was out of downtown Sandusky. I think they were bought soon after that and merged into another railroad company, if I remember correctly. Uh, Kilbourne Cooperage. Uh, so... Uh, Cooperage, as some of you may know, is a place that they would, where they built barrels. Uh, barrel manufacturing was a huge industry for lots of years in Sandusky. I think one time in the 1800s, I think there were like 15, 16 different Cooperages in town. Um, people used barrels for storage in their house. It was used for storage in the workplace, uh, but where barrels were were really used was for shipping things on the railroads. Um, and that's, it isn't actually until really Hind and Dow come in and start convincing these companies that they can start using cardboard alternatives for, uh, for shipping things on the railroad that the, the, wood, the barrel starts to disappear as a staple on the railroads. Uh, by 1924, the uh, Cooperage, um, there's only two, I think three, there's three Cooperages in town, two of which we'll look at. Um, this was the Kilbourne Cooperage. Uh, the address, which is the same address today, is, the, is at uh, 520 East Water Street. Um, just another side note, uh, some of you may know before 1916, there were no East and West Streets in Sandusky. Um, it was just, you know, Market Street, Water Street, so on and so forth. Um, in 1915 to 16, uh, Columbus, of course, becomes the the designation street where everything there is east and west. Um, so all the addresses change. So if you're ever doing any genealogy work uh, in Sandusky prior to 1916, you have to convert all of those addresses um to what they are today uh but luckily we don't have to do this so 520 east water street is the right one and as you can see you know the whole factory and the storage was all kind of uh destroyed uh, here's a better picture of it and i i will i include this shot just for this um i mean just look at all the barrels and how many, you know, hundreds and thousands of barrels that they had stored in this facility and just totally got, you know, strewn everywhere. Um, and it's just, you know, unfortunately, this is kind of the, the death flow for Kilbridge Cooperage. Um, it sounds like they officially closed the year after so I don't know if they tried to sell off their stock or what they did before that, sell off all the barrels, but they never recovered from this tornado and they were officially closed within two years. So I, I don't even know if they ever rebuilt. And then here's just another angle, kind of the same picture. And it just shows, you know, how the building is completely destroyed and 
all of the barrels that they had to had to contend with. Oh, we have another one. I thought that was the last one, but once again, just giant piles of barrel. You know, here's a bicycle for for scale, just to give you an idea of what this must have looked like. Um, yeah, it's not this other cooperage, the Michelle. We'll we'll talk about that in a in a minute. Uh, but this is definitely the the Kilborn cooperage. Uh, so Mac Iron. Uh, some of you are, of course, familiar with Mac Iron. It's a company that's been here since 1901. Uh, originally, it was originally called the Ohio Structural Iron Company, founded by John D. Mac and A.C. Lynn. Uh, but Mac bought out his, his partner sometime between 1908 and 1912 and changed it to Mac Iron Works. Um, of course, Mac Iron is still a proud part of Sandusky, going strong today. We're glad to have them. Uh, but you can see their buildings got hit pretty heavily too. Uh, the roof's gone. You have a whole side of the building here is gone. Um, you know, railroad car again, which I hadn't noticed before. Um, but here's another kind of angle of it where the roof is gone and a whole part of this building. So they had to totally rebuild after the tornado. Um, I was lucky enough to get a tour of Mac Iron once, and they said the only thing that remains of the original building that they could salvage from the tornado was the floor. Everything else they had to tear down and rebuild anew. Uh, but they survived, and they, uh, you know, they they had all sorts of difficulties. Um, they had slow periods, um, but I one of the most interesting things that I uh, I thought was interesting was during, um, I believe it was World War II, they actually used German POWs from Camp Perry to help run the factory because they had labor shortages. Um, so I, it's it's a really interesting company and their, their whole history, you know, we could go on and talk a little bit more about it, but um, I just think it's, you know, just really interesting that they, this was another company who got totally devastated by the tornado were able to survive. And here's a look on the inside where you can see uh, some of the machinery that even though the building got pretty well destroyed, it looks like the machinery is okay. Um, so that probably helped to save them a little bit. Um, let me go backwards. Oh. I didn't change the name of the slide. I apologize. So that shouldn't say Mac Iron Works. I, I made a typo. Um, it should be the Michelle Cooperage Company. Um, so the business was started by August Michelle in 1880. Uh, his brother joined soon afterwards. Um, they were once again, another company that made barrels, uh, but you can see their building was pretty well flattened. Um, Here's another picture I think is really interesting. So you can see the houses in the background to give you an idea of the angle. And you can see this guy is sitting on the side of the building as it was blown over. And there's more people towards the top of the picture that, you know, they're walking on the ruins. So that you just can imagine that this whole building is just uh, blown over. And they did survive the tornado, but they moved. Um, after the tornado, they moved down to First Street, um, and they actually were operating until 1930 or 1931. So they did survive the tornado. They just moved, and it seems like they scaled down their production of barrels. But they did uh, keep going, luckily. Um, so this is the Sandusky Washing Company, originally called the One Minute Washer Company. And they produced washing machines. Uh, we actually have one of their washing machines in the basement of the Fall House um, on display. And you know, when you're thinking of their washing machines, think about one of those kind of like a big metal looks kind of like a big metal tub has a ringer on the top. You know, kind of a, a more old school, old fashioned washing machine, uh, which is what you have here. And uh, you can see the name, the, the original name, the One Minute Washer Company. 
uh, which they changed somewhere between 1916 and 1918. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, I don't know if they've changed ownership. I couldn't find anything like that, um, but uh, they did change names somewhere in there. So they were the Sandusky Washing Company by the time of the tornado. Uh, but they did survive the tornado. Uh, they rebuilt and they actually operated for another four years. And you can see their parts here. There are some of the barrels, washing machines. So you can tell this whole second story, which would have been made out of brick, along with the roof, is all gone. And here's a back view. It gives you a little better view of you could tell where, you know, there's the beam that support the help to support the roof, and that's completely fallen over. And you know, it's totally gone. What I find interesting is if you look. Almost all the windows are still intact, which I find very interesting that you have this building that, you know, it's taken off the entire second story, but you have windows that survived the damage. Um, so here, a lot of these houses aren't here anymore, but I wanted to share them because once again, uh, people are familiar with with Sandusky, know where this is. So this is the corner of Perry and East Market Street, and this is what they would, uh, the north the north west corner. Um, so kind of looking if you're standing on the corner, um, looking towards uh, more like downtown area. And you can see once again, these stone buildings for the most part intact, but the roofs are entirely gone. Uh, so once again, Perry's Market Street, looking the other way down the street, uh, you can see down towards the water, you can see a ship here in the background. Uh, but, you know, second stories of houses totally gone. Uh, all these trees ripped up on this side too. Um, it really gives you a sense of how much damage was done. And once again, looking the other way now, you know, here's an electrical line across the beginning of the picture, um, along with all the tree damage that are uprooted. Here's a how the roof of a house that got blown off. Um, there's a hole in the side of the house to really give you an idea of the, like kind of the the scale of the damage. And once more, a row of houses here with, you know, the, some of these houses, you know, this one has most of its roof still, but, you know, this one, the entire roof is gone. Down here, same thing where the roof is gone and these trees are just totally shattered. Um, and you have pictures, people here in the foreground here and here to kind of give you a scale of how big these trees are and the debris that's kind of just blown everywhere. And more East Market between Perry and Miggs. Uh, just, you know, there's there was a house here. It's not anymore. Um, or probably a garage is probably the back. This is probably a garage that was totally destroyed. Here's the car. Um, but once again, just how much damage this tornado did and how surprising that it, it didn't, we didn't have more death. We had lots of injuries. I think we had uh, 80, 100 people end up in the hospital due to this, but we ended up only with six deaths. Uh, so the Sandusky Tool Company, uh, excuse me. So the Sandusky Tool Company was founded in 1869 by George Barney Sr. He was the first president. Um, so where Sandusky Tool was located would be across Mig Street from where the Maritime Museum is. So kind of where the Sandusky Police Department and Municipal Court is today. Uh, right in there uh, is where Sandusky Tool was and the waterworks which we'll talk about here in a minute as well. And uh, this was a company, like I said, 
starting in 1869, operated until 1930, 1932. And they were a major employer in town. Uh, what they're probably best known for, what their specialty was, was they made planes for woodworking, for shaving wood down to uh, cer certain thicknesses, making grooves or things like that. Um, the company itself had several patents for doing that over the years and was for almost as long as it operated was a very substantial business here in town. And it did survive, like I said, it operated until at least 1930. So they did rebuild to an extent they were able to keep going. Um, and they had a large, I don't know, it was a campus complex of buildings. Um, and you can see, once again, the roofs are off on a lot of these buildings uh, here, windows are broken, um, debris kind of scattered everywhere, trees, you know, beat up and destroyed. Um, Here's a front, like the front of the building, you can see it says Sandusky Tool Co. right in front of us. Um, but the roof's gone. The All the tree debris buildings in the background. Um, this must have been very important. One of the things you can tell is important is by how many pictures there are of something. Uh, and this building or this area, we, we have the second most amount of pictures of tornado damage from the Sandusky Tool Co. It kind of gives us an insight to what people thought was important or what what they wanted to show and what they saw as impressive. So, um, I, you know, this was something I had to include in my walk. Um, here's another angle. This is the main building we just saw the front of. Here's another side building. You can see some of the machinery inside is destroyed. It's hard to tell from all the tree damage, but it's in there. Um, just once again, shows you how powerful this storm was. You know, this this back wall was stone and it's gone. Um, so this is the Sandusky Waterworks. Um, so right next to Sandusky Tool, right in that area of the Municipal Court and where the tennis courts and all over there is, that's where the original waterworks were. Um, so Sandusky didn't build a waterworks till, well, it wasn't, they didn't pass the resolution until January of 1875. Uh, it started started working in 1876. Uh, but what's interesting is uh, when you go into the newspapers, you find people who were kind of campaigning, requesting that the city council put in a water station, a waterworks since 1855 ish. Um, so almost, you know, a full 20 years before we actually get it. Um, and they're talking about how other cities like Cleveland, Toledo, Cincinnati are getting these waterwork systems put in. Um, and we need one here in Sandusky. You know, if you remember by this time, Sandusky had suffered through two cholera epidemics. Uh, and by the 1850s, 1860s, they understand that cholera somehow is spread through the water. Um, not that they necessarily understand all the germ theory and everything by it, that's still a long way off, but they do understand clean water is how you prevent cholera. Um, and I wanted to show this because it shows you kind of everything intact. We don't have a lot of before pictures for all of these, um, but you can see here's the waterworks and I especially want to draw your attention to the giant metal water tower. Um, so it stayed in that location until 1940, so they rebuilt. Um, so this is the back of the waterworks. After the tornado, you can tell most of the roof is gone. Um, you can see this wall is totally gone. Uh, luckily, which we'll talk about in a minute, the actual mechanisms inside weren't too badly damaged. Um, it was mostly structural damage to this building. Um, but you saw that picture, I'll go back to it for a second, you know, the giant water tower here. Um, of course, they got blown over. Um, so this gives you a good idea of what that actually looks like. And here's a gentleman to kind of give you a scale of how big the diameter of that pipe was. Um, and I talked about 
them taking pictures and that kind of shows what's really important to them at the time period. Well, this kind of the most pictures that we have are of the damage to the waterworks, especially of the water pipe, as they called it. Because it's huge, you saw it. it's it's not only round, but it's very high. Um, so because of this, you know, people were impressed that it had fallen over. Um, I don't have any more pictures of it. Um, so it, it is, you know, one of the big, big events in, or one of the things that's really kind of most shocking to people when at the time period, um, just like I said, going off of the number of pictures they took. So here's the front page of the register. Um, uh, so like I said the tornado was June 28th. Um, so that would have been 29th was Sunday. So that would have been Saturday. The register prints its Monday paper. Uh, total dead all points 109. Um, now that includes um, Lorraine. Now, like I said, Sandusky, you saw the damage, but we luckily didn't get, there wasn't as many deaths and there wasn't as much damage as there could have been just because it didn't go any far, any further south than really Market Street is where it stayed. Um, and it, went kind of stayed in the more it did hit some residential areas but hit a lot more of like the working area um so you can tell you know 109 uh dead they say six dead 100 100 injured here and that is about right um in there's two people like, kind of outside of the sand who are injured and die uh, from the high winds and the storm weather, but they're not actually killed by the tornado during this time period. 100 injured seems to be about right. Uh, the rain ends up with close to, I think, 80 or 90 dead, uh, unfortunately, during uh, during this. They get hit more of the residential area. Also, the big death count on the rain comes from the tornado hits a movie theater. And they, there was a show in progress and the building got hit. It got, you know, pretty well destroyed. And that's where the huge death count comes from, unfortunately. Um, you can see here it says 16 left in the hospital. Um, I think that number grows slightly, but it's not a huge amount. Um, so there is a re immediate response to it. Uh, the one of the people who ends up in the hospital is actually the city manager for Sandusky, um, which kind of throws the governing of Sandusky into disarray. Um, so the mayor holds a basically impromptu city council meeting in his house and they form a provisional government for Sandusky. And the mayor you know, goes to each council member and says, you know, you're in charge of getting water back pumping. You're in charge of getting electricity back. You know, and he gives he assigns these roles to all these people uh, to try and get Sandusky back, get it running, get it safe as quickly as they can. Um, and to their credit, they do. Uh, so the uh, the water, if I remember correctly, they started pumping water again uh, within 48 hours which considering how hard the waterworks got hit, is very impressive that they got the water going. Uh, the governor did respond as well. Uh, I mentioned we had National Guard troops here, we did. Uh, they needed a place to put them. So they actually set up their camps in Washington Park. So these pictures you see of their cook stoves uh, and people watching them in the background. Um, this is all in Washington Park. That's where they set up their tents, their stoves, everything, and have them uh, work from there. Uh, what I think is really interesting about this picture, uh, this box right where my cursor is, if you can read it, it says Kellogg's Corn Flakes. I think it's really fascinating that, that, that you can read that. Um, and then in the, to include the other, I didn't, uh, I, we have another picture I forgot to put in. They have a box that's about the same size, but it's upside down 
and it says uh, it says whole shredded wheat. So another type of cereal that they had. Um, and so the National Guard, as far as I can tell, was here for about a week or two. Uh, and what's interesting is they actually um, declared or kind of enforced martial law in the area of where all the uh, where all the tornado damage was to make sure that there wasn't rioting and looting and things like that. Um, so it, so they played that was a big part of the role they played here in Sandusky was just to kind of make sure that people's property wasn't being stolen and the businesses didn't have stuff being stolen from them. Um, so this was uh, pulled this from the the register on June 30th. This is from the uh, Sandusky Gas and Electric Company. They're saying gas is going to be shut off today or Tuesday, July 24th between 12 o'clock noon and 5 o'clock p.m. Um, that's to, re, you know, as you can see, to repair the line damage done to the line due to the tornado. But once again, you know, so that means gas service was running pretty quickly after the tornado, which is quite impressive. Um, and I found this, uh, this gets run for almost every day for a week after the tornado. It's a warning from the Sandusky Gas and Electric Company of making sure people understand that they should not touch uh, down electrical wires and to let the company deal with that. And the electricity service will resume as soon as they get all the down wires and can get things going again. Uh, but I believe it was only, I believe kind of like to how Sandusky today where maybe one part of the town might lose power, but the other part doesn't. I believe it was the same way where they had, they could control it, that it wasn't all of Sandusky that was without uh, power, but just a small part of it. Um, the city government also does other things. They basically cut through red tapes and red tape and uh, expedite people's building permits for repairs to their house and their businesses. Um, they basically say, you know, if you apply for it, we're just gonna rubber stamp it and let it go. They're just, they wanna get the city rebuilt as quick as they can. Uh, what I find interesting within two weeks of the tornado, all tornado related damage accounts, they are gone from the front page of the paper. It is, it, it's still there in the later ones and they're still talking about some of the, um, about some of the repairs going on and things like that, but it falls out of the headlines of the paper relatively quickly. So that, you know, part of that shows that, uh, well, that's not selling papers anymore because it's kind of old news if there's no big changes going on. But at the same time, it also shows that re uh, work was going fairly quickly and they were rebuilding Sandusky pretty quickly. Um, so like I said, it, it, it could have, the tornado could have been much worse to Sandusky. We could have ended up like Lorraine. Um, and one of the other things that's kind of interesting that shows up, this shows up July 1st. So this shows up, what, three days after the tornado. Tornado or windstorm insurance. Good solid company. This ad was not in the paper before the tornado. I looked, I checked. So this this made me, I don't wanna say chuckle, but it, it did that there was this insurance company that was ready to capitalize on the damage that was done here in Sandusky. And they said, well, people are worried about it now. So we're gonna go sell the insurance and make extra money. Um, so I, I was I thought that was interesting that that you know that people will capitalize on anything whenever they can. Um, the last part that I uh, didn't have a slide for, but I think it's really interesting is where the tornado came from, um, and it's surprising. But when you read the newspaper accounts, it sounds like it was two water spouts or cyclones, tornadoes over the water. Uh, they started out by Peely Island. Uh, there were two of them. They eventually merged into one, and they came down into Sandusky. Seems like that's the first place they made real landfall. And they went through Sandusky, you know, kind of 
falling uh, east shore, uh, east shoreline, east water, east market, going out through the uh, east cove there where all the boat houses are. Um, and it followed the coast all the way down to Lorraine and hit hit them hard as well. And there's actually newspaper accounts at the time where barrels from uh, one of the cooperages in Sandusky was found in the rain, that it was carried all that distance by the tornado. So that's the question part. So I'm going to stop sharing. So if anyone types in the chat box, I can actually see it. Um, and if anyone does have any questions, they can unmute themselves. Uh, this is Eileen. Hi, Eileen. Uh, when we moved into our house on Marlboro Street about 45 years ago, there was an elderly um, gentleman who lived next door, and his account of this was that it was a very hot Saturday afternoon. Uh, he was a lawyer, and he'd been working in the courthouse, and he went to a men's club on the second floor of the building at the west end of Washington Row, where Washington Row meets mm -hmm. Jackson Street. Yeah. It was a, a, a men's club in the second floor there. And when, right after the tornado tore through, the sheriff came to that men's club and said, boys, go home and get your guns. I'm deputizing all of you. <laughs> so before the National Guard arrived, it was actually this ad hoc group of men who happened to be having a beverage on a hot uh, hot June afternoon. And, and um, Mr. Baxter did that. Uh, it wasn't apparently, it wasn't unusual for men to have weapons in their homes. And they, um, they did patrol along, uh, he said along East Market Street. He was stationed um, somewhere down toward Meg Street in that residential area. Yeah, that that's not surprising. Like I said, that that was the biggest. Um, so it was kind of, it was kind of interesting because uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Because security was a big thing, and people were worried about you know people stealing things. Um, yeah, looting and, was was a concern. Yeah, but what right I found away. really interesting is, of course, today we're having a. Uh, there's more discussions about uh, police brutality, the limits of what the police should be doing, things like that, and. What what I found interesting, there was an article about a week or so after the tornado when the National Guard was there and they were starting to get ready to leave, uh, talking about how, you know, some people have complained about the the National Guard being too zealous in their prosecution of martial law and, you know, things like that. And so, but the, that is the vocal minority. A majority of Sandusky's applaud what what is going on to uh, the work the National Guard has done. And it just struck me, uh, struck me as a conversation a little different, but similar to what's being had today. And I've seen other things like that where uh, when I was researching the waterworks, I saw articles where people were complaining the city council wasn't listening to the people of Sandusky about the waterworks and they were just rubber stamping whatever the city manager wanted to do and why won't they address the needs of the city? And I'm like, and I've I've heard those complaints since I've lived in Sandusky too, and it it just shows that, you know, that might have been 1855, 1860, but those those similar complaints are still still here, um, and they're still around, and it it goes to show that yeah, technology changes, but people don't change all that much over time. There's still a lot of the same complaints and things like that. So that that that's why I included the ad for the tornado and windstorm insurance because you know there was this company that saw this and they're like man we can make money off this disaster let's do it um and i don't know how successful they were or anything but it, it just was kind of interesting um i saw sarah asked a question in the chat uh, where was all the de debris disposed that's a wonderful question um i never got a good answer um probably some of it was uh probably if they could find like wooden beams or things that were intact some of it probably was reused 
Um, but I, it never said where everything was being dumped in the newspaper. Now, that could mean a couple things. The most probable one is, well, everyone in town knew where the city dump was or wherever, and that's just the logical place it was going to get dumped, so we didn't write about it in the paper. Um, that, that would be my guess, uh, but I, I never found anything in the newspapers that talked about disposing of the, uh, the debris, but it's a really good question. Um, because it is, it would be fascinating to know if, if where all that went. Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, oh not unmuted. I don't think I can unmute you. Oh, there you go. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I know it's technology. It took me a little while. Um, what they did, I was in a tornado, with, um, a big one. They rate them from one to five. And my community was very small down on the Ohio River. We had a total, I believe, of eight deaths. And I was at a brownie meeting. By brownie, I mean Girl Scouts. Yeah. So, um, it, it was very, very hard to get around because there was a lot of debris in the streets. Um, we were very unsure where we were supposed to go. We didn't know where my dad was. It, it, the whole thing was, and then rumors, of course, are, are coming. But um, we managed to abandon our car um, on a very quiet street and walk the west of the rest of the way home and my dad was there but oddly enough he went and got his gun because he owned a dry cleaners right next to a grocery store and everyone was concerned that the grocery store was going to be you know a, a big place where you could just take everything you wanted yeah and so he took his shotgun and uh, he and the owner of the grocery store um, kind of kept watch until the uh, Ohio National Guard eventually came. And, but the grocery store owner, when all the refrigerated or frozen food still didn't have any electricity the day after, he just gave it to whoever wanted or needed it and just said, you know, take what you can eat today or tomorrow um, because the it's just gonna ruin it. Yeah. So he kind, kind of kept the community from starving because it was very difficult to get in and out of the area. And they took all of the downed trees and through the, I, there were many hills and valleys where I lived and they just decided they threw everything into um, a valley that was next to the hill that I lived on. And people were free uh, whenever they wanted to come cut up part of a tree if you needed it, uh, take branches if you could handle it, or probably about three or four years after that, wood was free. If you need to throw wood in your fireplace, come and get it. But um, I don't sc think school reopened. This happened in April. And I don't think school reopened until September because everybody was just, I can't even tell you how many houses got smashed and it was yeah. considered yeah, a, a level five tornado, which to a little teeny town, um, it's just like, the apocalypse. So there you go. Yeah. And hi, Eileen. It's good to see you. So in, in Sandusky, it really seems like the the residential area that was hit was just that um, that uh, was the stretch of East Market there from not Wayne, but the next street over. And you know, I can't think of it all. Is that Hancock? Uh, next street over from Wayne. Uh, 
in East Market there, that seems to be the only really major residential area that got hit. Now we talked about the, the people in the apartment above uh, Grouch Cole, who uh, unfortunately the son that passed away, but I, that's I think what helped keep the death toll so low was it was a Saturday, so there weren't as many people in the in like the, the working district of where this tornado hit. And we also got a little lucky that everyone made it off the auto ferry line. Uh, the Beckling wasn't <laughs> wasn't sitting there because that's where, you know, right where it would have been would have been is right where the Beckling would have docked. Um, mm -hmm. and if, oh, yeah, yeah, very smart move by whoever. Yeah, that they saw that and they didn't do that. Yeah. So we were very lucky that 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 the death toll was as low as as it was that we only had six. Um, anyone else have any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, of course. Uh, the uh, I was just looking at the map. Uh, you say that the, the it started as a couple of water spouts, uh, Peely Island area. Yes. Well, that's almost yep. a direct north south line. It must it must have taken a, a it's kind of unusual for for come straight down south. And then all of a sudden, just veer east towards uh, Lorraine. Uh, I, I, I like a sight to see. Did any damage happen in? in uh, did, did it touch down at all uh, in Marblehead or anywhere like that that you know of? Not so. Not that I know of. And if it did, it was very very slight. Um, because it doesn't come up in the newspaper reports at all. Okay. Um, so, it, so my guess is that it must have missed that because they don't, they don't mention it at all in, in any of the newspaper accounts. Okay. Um, so if it, if when it crossed, it must have been in an area that there wasn't much there or wouldn't have done much damage. Cause like I said, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't really get mentioned in the papers at all. Okay. Very yeah, unusual very, track though. Yes, it is. And that, that's what I, and, and the only reason I believe it is because I see it. it it's, you know, they, they eventually it takes them a couple of days to kind of figure out what it was, but that's their final conclusion is this is what happened. Um, so I, I, Kind of believe that that is kind of the end of the end of the road there. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got one. It's unrelated, but it was something regarding what you said about uh, the uh, change in addresses back in the uh, a, uh, 1915, 1916. Yeah. Yep. What about the north? What about the north and south uh, street? Were those also changed at the same time? I believe. I'm I'm not sure. Okay. Um. I I think I think so, but I know the big split was east west because that was downtown where all the businesses were and stuff. And what in most of the research I do, that's the, that's the area I focus a lot of when I'm looking up stuff is in that area because that's where okay. we have most information on. So that's what everyone was talking about was the east west split. Okay. Thank um, you. You're welcome. All right. Well, then, if no one has any other questions, um, I want to thank you all for joining us for this great program. Um, we should hopefully, knock on wood, actually by the uh, by this fall, come September, we should hopefully be able to be meeting in person. Um, so that's that's our hope, and that's what we're kind of planning on. So hopefully, we'll be able to see you all in person soon. Um, thank you again for joining us, and. Enjoy the rest of your day.